110 in that red hymn book as we all stand up together and sing out on Oh, what's singing, oh, what's shouting. Looking forward to that heaven's jubilee one of these days. Page 110. Some glad morning we shall see Jesus in the air. Coming after you and me, joy is ours to share. What rejoicing there will be when the sun shall rise. Ready for that jubilee yonder in the skies. Oh, what singing, oh, what shouting. On that happy morning when we all shall rise. Oh, what glory, hallelujah. When we meet our blessed Savior in the skies. Seems that now I almost see all the saints in hand. Rising for that jubilee that is just ahead. In the twinkling of an eye, change with him to be. All the living saints so tied to that jubilee. Oh, what singing, oh, what shouting. On that happy morning when we all shall rise. Oh, what glory, hallelujah. When we meet our blessed Savior in the skies. When with all that heavenly host we begin to sing. Singing in the Holy Ghost, how the heavens will ring. High as there was through the storm, with them we shall be. Praising Christ who wages on heaven's jubilee. Oh, what singing, oh, what shouting. On that happy morning when we all shall rise. Oh, what glory, hallelujah. When we meet our blessed Savior in the sky. Well, good morning, church. Are we doing well on this gorgeous day? Amen. It's kind of hard to not be doing well when the day is this beautiful. I'm glad that you're here. I think the Lord has something for us today. How about you? Amen. I'm excited. So we're going to ask God to bless our service, and then we will sing another song. Brother George Brenneman, would you please lift your voice, ask God to meet with us, and when Brother Brenneman is done praying, we will sing another song. Amen. All right, saints, in that red hymn book, 378. Now, page 378. When I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. I'm so glad for that. Amen. 378. Christ our Redeemer, tied on the cross, tied for the sinner, laid on his tomb. All who receive him, he never hear, for he will pass. Shake hands with one another.
right as we make our way back to our seats, we'll sing it on that last verse of 378. Oh, what compassion. shipping. All right, ushers, come on up. We'll receive the offering, and I pray that you will be faithful as the Lord has blessed, as he has prospered you. Let us give back to him. He's been good to us, hasn't he? Amen. Amen. All right. Now, I typically have a rule. The usher with the coolest shoes prays. Amen. So who, who are we thinking, Brother Ryan? Oh, you're turning on the mic. Okay, so they can hear you. All right. So, Brother Jared, would you mind please asking God to bless our offering? Thank you, brother. We'd like to thank you for letting us gather today. Father in heaven, we'd just like to thank you and praise you and ask that you take this offering and do as you please with it. It's all yours anyway. And we just like to ask that it goes out and it goes forth to your service. And we just like to ask that if there's anybody here in the service today that doesn't know you, that through the preaching that you would bless it, the Holy Spirit would move and they come to know you as Lord and Savior in Jesus Christ's holy name. We'd like to pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. for us. If you have your bulletins, you can follow along. We have quite a few announcements to cover. Uh, tonight after the service is our teen cafe fundraiser. This is where the teenagers will uh, provide the food and the service for a time of food and fellowship after the service tonight. All the proceeds will go toward the youth ministry. So if you're uh, up for sticking around for some food and fellowship after the service tonight, you're more than welcome to, and it also benefits our teenagers. So make note of that. That's tonight after the service. Also tonight, choir practice will be at 5 rather than 4.30. Choir practice is at 5, and uh, there are a few people uh, out sick, not feeling well. So with that being the case, there will not be any child care provided. Normally, uh, we, have some, uh, we have a place where the kids can go during choir, but tonight we will be unable to do that. So choir practice is at 5, but make note there's no child care this evening. And I will say, if there's someone who uh, perhaps wants to volunteer, you can talk to me or Brother Ryan after the service, and maybe we can work something out there. Next Sunday, after the morning service, we'll have a potluck lunch. Everyone is welcome. We ask that you bring uh, some food to share. And so after the morning service, there'll be a lunch downstairs. After the time of food and fellowship, there'll be a 1 p.m. service to follow the meal. No evening service that night, so make note of that. That's next Sunday, 1 p.m. service, a meal after the morning service, no evening service. Missions conference is coming up fast, about a week and a half away. You have the service times and the dates there in your bulletin. Uh, missions conference services each night at 7 p.m. There'll be a different missionary uh, presenting his ministry and preaching to us each night. So be there for every night so you can get to know these guys and their families and uh, their burden and where the Lord's going to send them. 
and we need to be praying about how the Lord would use us in the area of missions. That Saturday, we have a time of outreach in the morning, followed by the missions meal. Everyone is welcome for that, but I do ask that you sign up so we have an account of how many people we'll be feeding. And also, if you can bring some food to that, that would sure be a blessing. That is Saturday, June the 3rd. The info's in the bulletin. The sign-up sheets are on the back table. Mission Sunday is two weeks from today. So be praying for that. Uh, there will be missionaries teaching and preaching in the Sunday school classes and the services as well. So that's always a fun, busy time, but a fun time. So I hope you plan to be there for that. Vacation Bible School is coming up as well. That'll be in mid-June. You see that uh, insert there in your bulletin, the information, the times. If you have any questions, you can see Miss Abria regarding that. But we're excited for Vacation Bible School. Did want to make mention of a few other things. Uh, if you have children and you're praying about a Christian school, we have friends in Evansville at Faithway Baptist Church that are launching a Christian school. There's a handout on the back table, so if that would be a blessing to you, you grab this handout, take it with you after the service, and you can read up on all the things that they offer, okay? Uh, also, this is our, uh, our annual missions conference booklet that I pass out. Uh, I'm going to pass these out tonight, and then they'll be available for everyone next Sunday morning. Uh, tonight, I will pass them out. It's one per family or uh, one for rep representative, however you want to word that. Uh, but it has the details of what to expect. It has some information regarding our missionaries. It has a uh, list of all the missionaries we currently support and where they're going. Uh, there was a sermon preached here about 10 years ago called Praying for Missionaries. I've always included that outline there. Just kind of gives us some ways we can specifically pray for these families that otherwise you may not think about. So there's a lot of helpful things in these booklets, and I'll get those passed out tonight and then make them available next Sunday morning as well. But that just tells us all about the missions conference and things happening. That is a big time in our church calendar, and I hope you're praying for it, and I hope you plan to be there for that as well, okay? I believe that's all the announcements that I do have. So, Brother Ryan, why don't you come and lead us in some more songs? We're going to take our blue hymnals now, and we're going to go to page 439. And we're going to sing Dwelling in Beulah Land, page 439. Let's stand and sing. Stand and sing Blue Hymn 439.
singing this morning. 465 for our final song. 465 as we sing about drawing me nearer and nearer to my blessed Lord. Amen. 465. word. I invite you to take your Bibles, please, anywhere, because it's all good. Amen. But for this morning, we'll go to Matthew chapter 28, please. Matthew chapter number 28. Matthew chapter number 28. Matthew chapter number 28. Last week, I spoke on power for production. And uh, the gist of the message was that anything the Lord tells us to do, commands us to do, challenges us to do, prompts us to do, word it how you will, the Lord will equip us to do that thing. Whatever it may be and whatever capacity it may be, the Lord will equip us to do what he, has what he has called us to do. So we talked about power for production last Sunday morning, and this morning we're going to look at committing to the commission. And uh, if you have been in church any amount of time, you probably figured where we would be today. Matthew chapter number 28, beginning in verse 16. Matthew chapter number 28, beginning in verse number 16. Matthew 28, 16. Are you there? All right, this is what it says in Matthew 28, 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And I want to talk to you about committing to the commission. Let's pray. Father, we need you now. I thank you very much for the faithfulness of these, your dear people. Lord, I know many are out today traveling or sick or whatever the case may be, and I pray that you'd please be with them. But Lord, for those who are here, we desire a touch from heaven today. Lord, we need you to guide us in this very important area of the Great Commission. Lord, we're so excited for Missions Conference and the blessings and the challenges that come with that. But Lord, I pray that you'd uh, kind of warm us up and get us ready for our, uh, ready our hearts and our minds and to be receptive of the things the missionaries say. And Lord, 
covered really overall the idea of missions, what it is, and what it requires of us. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you'd please fill me with your power. You'd please fill this place with your presence. Lord, I pray that you'd please deal with us individually and corporately. Please, God, deal with our hearts. Help us to be more like you. We need you now. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> now, in our text, Jesus has resurrected, and he desires his followers to gather around him in Galilee. And we know from Acts chapter 1 that Jesus would ascend into heaven, and we know that he's promised one day to come back again. How many of y'all believe that promise? So we have this instrumental, vital period right in between Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and then his return in glory to sit at the right hand of the Father. So there's this span, and in this span of time, there's a lot of important things that transpire. He gave some instruction to those who are desiring to follow him with their lives. Now, would you agree with kind of painting that picture that whatever Jesus would have said in this time must be extremely important? Would you agree with that? Anything Jesus said is important. But right after his resurrection and then before his ascension in that time period, what Jesus would have said had to have extreme weight and gravity to those words. So this is the text that we read in Matthew 28, verse 16 through 20. This passage is frequently called the Great Commission due to it being a great commission, <laughs> a challenge that is so heavy in importance it cannot be overlooked. So Jesus commands us to do some things until he gets back. And I'd like to remind us, church, this morning that these are still the instructions until he gets back. These did not expire. Okay, the instructions he gave here, they are still in place until he calls us together to be with him. All right, so this is still active. This is still the mission in play. Now, many of us have forgotten it. Many of us have overlooked it. But church, this morning, I'm going to challenge you a little bit that this is still the mission. In fact, it is the great commission. Now, Mission Sunday is two weeks from now. And missions conference kicks off in about a week and a half. And this annual time in our church, it's very important. It refreshes our memories. It refreshes our minds and our hearts about the importance of this commission and the urgency of the hour. The mission, the uh, reason for our missions conference could be summed up in three words, and that is people need Christ. People need Christ. And we have an entire week set apart every year on your calendar for the sole purpose of getting our hearts reignited for that purpose that people need Jesus. All people, all tongues, all tribes, all nations, all backgrounds, all statuses, everywhere. People need the Lord, and we have been commissioned to go and tell them. So, Aside from Brother Brian, sound booth, am I on up here? I'm not getting much power in this, and I'm not getting much response, so maybe I should start over. Let me check my connection here. All right, well, turn me up if you can. I appreciate it. Now, here locally, there's nothing stopping us from doing that, fulfilling the Great Commission, except us. There is nothing stopping you from fulfilling the Great Commission here locally except you. It is not illegal to proselytize. 90% of the people you come in contact with are going to be very kind, very considerate. It is not immoral or unethical or illegal or unscriptural to give out gospel tracts. And I'm going to tell you this, church, and people don't like this, but even the no soliciting signs do not apply to you because you're not selling anything. Okay? If you do some word study and some research, you'll realize you're not selling anything. You're simply inviting folks to church. So what I'm doing is I'm knocking down all these barriers of excuses that we have built up in our minds. Oh, I could never do that. Sure you can. You are the reason you won't. And I am the reason that I won't. So I echo once more, the only thing preventing us from sharing the gospel is us. Now, you can breathe because that's not the brunt of my message this morning. But I'm going to tell you, it is a featured side item that came with the entree. You may enjoy that free of charge. Only a fool would argue that Christians do not have to share the gospel with others. 
On Wednesday nights, we've been going verse by verse through the book of Acts for well over a year now, and you simply cannot argue that the New Testament Christians were all about sharing the gospel house to house, person to person, marketplace to marketplace, community to community, preaching and proclaiming the gospel privately and publicly to anyone who would listen and to anyone who was truly, sincerely hungry for the truth. They were there to fill that need. And if you look with me in verse 19 of our text, you'll see that this command, it is not just for the local area. It is for all nations. In fact, Jesus' very last words that he said before he ascended into heaven, you can find them in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, but ye shall receive power. Now, isn't that funny? What did he say in verse 18? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. What does he say in Acts 1, 8? Uh, he says, but ye shall receive power. Again, ties into last Sunday's message, power for production. The Lord equips us to carry this out. So you can't say, Pastor, I could never do that. You're right, I couldn't either. But thankfully, God gives us power to do what he tells us to do. We need to stop relying on ourselves so much and trust in him and simply obey and watch him do wonders. Acts 1.8, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The mirroring verse in another gospel account is Mark 16, 15, where Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So there is absolutely no doubting that we are tasked. We are given the responsibility of sharing the gospel in our local area with the local community people, with the people in our circles, but we are also supposed to share it with the people in the uttermost parts of the earth. Say, where's that, preacher? That's everywhere. That's all nations. That's worldwide without discrimination. Are they breathing? Yeah. Then they need to hear the gospel. That's what it means. In Mark 13, Jesus discusses the end times. He's talking about his return, and he gives several parameters regarding that, and he says this. Listen to this in Mark 13, 10. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. <clears throat> then shall the end come. So it's almost as if the Lord is staying his return until every tongue, every tribe, every nation gets the gospel and has a chance to believe on Christ in their language so they have a chance to be saved according to those two passages we just read. And I figured it'd get quiet. I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but according to that scripture, it looks like we can have a small part in when he does. Should I read it again? Mark 13, 10, And the gospel must first be published among all nations. Matthew 24, 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Do not leave here and say, Pastor knows when Jesus is coming back. I don't. I, I truly don't. But I can study just like you can study. I can pray just like you can pray. I can research like you can research. And I can see that it appears this is kind of a big deal to Christ that his gospel be published among all nations and all tongues for all tribes everywhere without discrimination, without hesitation, full throttle, gospel go into the whole world. It seems to me that that's a big deal to our Savior. So all of that to say this. Church, it's not enough to take the gospel to your neighbors. It's admirable, it's commendable, and it's commanded. You ought to. But we need to be involved in sending the gospel to all nations and all languages. Don't they deserve a chance to get saved too? Now, I highly doubt that the majority of you are going to cease your lives as you know it, sell off everything you own, and go start a church in Spain or India or Africa or China or anywhere else worldwide, right? You're, you're not going to do that. And I, I'm not going to do that. So what are we to do? We've made it clear the gospel is supposed to go everywhere. This was commissioned to his followers. I are a follower, and you are too. What can we do to play a part in getting the gospel to go across the world? We can't be everywhere at once. Thankfully, it seems to me that the Lord has a plan of action. Aren't you glad he's always steps ahead? Aren't you glad that he knows what's coming before we do? Now, we don't have to go through this again because we've studied this in the book of Acts, but 
uh, the pattern of missionary church planting. You can see that, and we've looked into that, and we know that the Holy Ghost will select certain men for certain tasks, just like when we trust Christ as Savior, we're all saved, and then we're all called to serve, and we all have parameter. We all have these things we're supposed to do, but not everyone is called to move their families to Italy. Not everyone is called to move their families to South Africa or England or, or, or travel abroad and reach certain people groups. Not everyone is called for a purpose like that. Not everyone will be planting a church. Not everyone will pastor a church. You know, just to give you an example, I'm not sure how many in the auditorium today, 60, 70, 80, I don't know, somewhere in that range, a Baptist preacher would say, oh, there's about 140 there this morning. Uh, probably about 70, 80 or so. I think that's reasonable. But there's only one person called to pastor this church right now. Isn't that something? That doesn't mean I'm any better or any worse than the next guy. It just means for whatever reason, in God's divine plan, he said, all these people, I want them at that church. I'm calling them uh, to be saved, baptized members. I praise God for that. Anyone's welcome, but I believe that membership is scriptural, baptism, salvation, absolutely. And I have them called to serve, called to give, called to do all this stuff. But there is only one person I have chosen to pastor, oversee the church for this time, for this place. That could, that could change tomorrow, but for right now, that's God's purpose you say, who's that? I better avoid that one. I don't want to bring the service down, but hi. It doesn't mean I'm any better, any worse than the next guy. It just means for whatever reason, that's what God wants. Just like for whatever reason, God has called the Matney family to South Africa. For whatever reason, God has called Brother Brian Fox to do barbecue, praise God, and, uh, and raise money for help missions. He's taking a trip to Bolivia this week. Yeah, Thursday. I know, I know, brother. <laughs> Thursday, it's coming. I know it is, brother. We need to be praying for him. You look at those men and women on the back wall there, you will see the different missionaries we currently financially partner with to send them overseas. And you would look, see, I'm not called to that place. I'm called right here. All of you are not called to that place, at least as of today. Again, God changes his mind, you know, whenever he wants to. I shouldn't say change his mind, but has a call for us that a lot of times as his will goes we realize and we grow into that just like when i first got saved if he had said you're going to be pastoring i'd have said ha ha see ya and i'd have moved away so a lot of times his will unfolds as we go but at this moment right now we would say well i don't feel called to go that way well they do and i think you and i need to find a way to partner with them to get them because we're not going to go that way here in a couple weeks we're going to meet three different families and they're going to share three different burdens three different types of areas for three different people groups and three different missions goals and things like that. It's all for God's glory. It's all to reach souls for Christ and get his word propagated and published, but you will just learn things and you'll see that and you'll say, well, I'm, I'm not called to that. That's not God's purpose for me, but I can certainly help you fulfill God's call for your life. God chooses certain people with certain responsibilities and that includes sending these foreign missionaries to these lands to share the gospel disciple new converts, and establish churches. And as we have gone verse by verse of the book of Acts, you will find that is the New Testament pattern for church planting seen throughout the book of Acts and reemphasized in the Pauline epistles. It seems like God had a plan all along. So why are there not more missionaries going? Why, why are more missionaries struggling and can't get to their mission field? Well, that's, <laughs> that's quite a topic. But I believe one of the big reasons, and there's several, one of the big reasons is we don't see the need to partner with it. One of the reasons is it's just not a big deal to us. We don't see the tribes overseas, and we don't see the hurting people overseas. We just see our own circles, and we're enamored with that. And sometimes we just have to be provoked and waken up to the reality that there are people dying without Christ every day all over the world. And you're not called to that specific nation or that specific people group or wherever it is but we can all have a part in helping them reach those people, and that's what Missions Conference does. It challenges us to say, how can I help? So, to summarize everything we've talked about, if you're saved, if you know Jesus as your Savior, you're a product of the gospel. By the way, if you're here and say, preacher, I don't know Jesus, I don't know if I'm saved, you stick around after the service, I will gladly show you how you can know for sure Jesus is your Savior and heaven is your home. Say, I don't like you. Okay, I'll let you talk to someone you do like. 
But the point is, there's plenty of people here who can show you how to be saved if you desire it. It is free and it is for you. Jesus wants to save you today. So we are a product of the gospel. We have the gospel. We're commanded to share the gospel everywhere to everybody. Again, not just locally, but everywhere. So locally, we can handle that. Oh, nothing's stopping you from passing out a gospel track at the restaurant, giving it to your waiter, your waitress, or the cashier when you gas up at Huck's or wherever, giving that to the gas station attendant or the person next to you or leaving it there in the, in the gas handle. Whatever it is, nothing is stopping you from taking the gospel here locally. But what about overseas? We know we're commissioned to have a part in that. I'm not going overseas. You're not going overseas. So what do we do? Well, God does speak to individual people. They surrender to their call. God sends them to that person or lays it on their heart to go. So the man in every situation is different, but in most cases he'll quit his job. He'll uproot his family. And he decides that they will aim to be at their God-given location, wherever that may be, within two years, two and a half years. But now comes the question, how are they going to do it? How are they going to survive? You can't just quit your job uproot your family, get in a van and travel around the country telling churches about your ministry. How are you going to survive? There's no income there. That's going to cost money, isn't it? Come on. You already know where this is going, so you might as well just jump all in. Come on. Yeah. It's going to cost a lot of money, church. It's going to cost a lot of money. In fact, this family, he goes on deputation, he travels the country, he presents his ministry, and he's hoping and he's praying that the Lord's going to lead some churches to financially partner with them. So this man and his family, they'll spend hours and hours setting up meetings and planning to be at churches of like-minded faith and just begging God, truly living by faith, begging God to provide the needs and to secure him some recurring faithful financial support so he and his family can go and do what God has called them to do. So he spends years going around trying to present his ministry. Will you support us? Will you uh, pay us? Will you help us? And we say, yes, we're going to support you for this much a, a month. So he budgets that and he goes to the next church and he goes and he goes and he goes so he can go to his spot so he can plant that church in the, the, the tribes that we've never seen in the countries we've never stepped foot in in these places. And he builds a church like this one and he wins people to Christ but he needs that income to help him go because he simply does not have it all himself now god has it and in most cases god has put it in our wallets and our purses and then there comes the time where it's like well i see the need and i understand it you know this guy he's doing his part he's doing the hard part by the way all right, he's uprooted his family. He's leaving behind everything he ever knew. He's in the car. He's got his kids loaded up. The GPS is set. The mission is fresh in their minds. Now he just needs fuel in the tank to get him where he's supposed to go and keep him there long enough to have an everlasting effect. This church is where we come in. This is where churches like ours band together and say, you know what? We can fill that need. We can do something to help that. We are not going to leave our comfort zone. We don't feel called to go to Africa or England or Australia, where it is. We don't. You do. Praise God. How can I help you reach people for Jesus? Because I'm not going there, but you are. What can I do to help? And you know what they're going to say? They're going to say, we could use your prayers. They're, and they're going to say that, and they could use your prayers. But church, as the mean old pastor, let me tell you, they need a little bit more than prayers. Guess what they need? money they need money it is what it is they need a nice car they need nice clothes don't make these men feel bad when they come up and and I, and by the way you come to missions conference i will put them up here i'll say you tell us what they need they'll say we just need prayer and i'm gonna say no tell us what you need you'll be amazed they'll say well we can't afford to buy our four-year-old shoes You'd be amazed some of the horror stories I've heard from these missionaries. They will travel 12 hours, they'll come to a church like this, and the pastor will slap them on the back, give them a coupon to Arby's, and send them on their way. I'm talking a family of six, no hotel, no love offering, no gas in their tank, no food, and they don't know what they're going to do. Because there are people like us who say, nah. Our, our daughter hasn't had a new dress for church in two years. But they're just going to say, we need prayer. If you'll just pray for us, and we should. 
but there are other real things that you need that they're going to need. But they're too embarrassed to talk about it because they don't want to, they won't want to come off with that vibe that, well, I, I need you to give me this, so I'm going to be the bad guy and tell you they need this stuff, just like you do. They just don't always have the luxury to go. What I'm saying is their needs, and we can fill that need. I know you're not going to go to Africa. I'm not. God's not called me to Africa. I'm not going to go to Australia. I'm not going to go to the prisons around the country. We're going to have a guy coming in. That's what he does. He goes to the prisons around the country, and he preaches to them. And he's got six children, young children. And they like wild crats and, and Paw Patrol. What's wrong with wild crats? I like wild crats. I mean, they do. I send them these emails months in advance, and they'll say, I'll say, what do you need? They say, oh, just prayer, just prayer. And I'm like, well, tell me something your kids like. Really? Yeah. Beef jerky, sun chips, chocolate bars, granola bars. One guy said bottled water. We can go to Walmart and get a case of bottled water. Paw Patrol for my kids. Legos, Patch the Pirate, and Mickey Mouse, Peppermint Altoids. These things you and I, we just take for granted. (laughs) Chick-fil-A. Praise God. (laughs) Tonight, you'll get all get a copy. You'll see everything in there. This is where we come in. This is where we say, okay, Lord, what can I do? You can pray. And number one, yes, you can pray. But number two, it's time to give. It's time to give. It's time to put our money where our mouth is. God commands the gospel to go out among all nations, and we know that we're not going to go. So what can we do? How can we help? You see how that works? That's the Great Commission. And can I tell you guys, it's not free. It's going to cost. It costs sacrifice. It costs selflessness. It costs willingness. If you're going to go all in for the gospel's sake, it's going to cost. It's going to cost some time. It's going to cost some resources. It's going to eat into your grocery budget a little bit. It's going to prevent you from going out to eat so much. It's going to eat into those streaming services, the Wi-Fi speed. It's going to cut into that a little bit. But church, I've got to ask you, isn't it worth it to, to lose one streaming service so I can give just a little bit more? To not go out to eat every night? To, to forfeit pizza night on Friday night and put that 20 in the missions plate? And by the way, missions, they'll tell you, that, that goes out. I mean, missions, you know, we have a, we have a I don't want to say surplus, but we have a reserve so we can keep these guys going. But anything over the reserve, we want to put it in play. That's missions money. It's meant to go out and fulfill the purpose. It's not like I I sit on this pile of money like Scrooge McDuck going, yeah. That's not how this works. We put it into play. Wisely, of course, with discretion. But absolutely, we get it out there doing what you gave it to do. Can I ask, what are you giving to the gospel ministry? I didn't ask what's your church given. What is your personal involvement, your name here? What do I do so that others can hear about Jesus Christ? How am I involved in the missions ministry? What can we do to help them fulfill God's call, these men and women who have surrendered, who are going? How can we equip them to go? You can pray for them, but you can give financially as well. We can do our part of the Great Commission by taking the gospel ourselves locally. That's what we're supposed to do. We're missionaries here. And by giving financially to send others around the world. I'd like you to go to Romans chapter 10, if you don't mind, please. Romans chapter 10. I don't believe you have to hold your spot in uh, Matthew, so let's just go over to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse number 1, please. (coughs) Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse number 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And by the way, that's a good prayer to have. When you drive around town, let's just pray that they be saved. 
pray that they would hear the gospel. When you drive past Castle High School and they have a football game and it's packed, pray that they might hear the gospel. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on the wise. Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or, Who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be, what? Sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Esaias saith, I, uh, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now we know that God will save anyone and everyone who calls on him by faith, believing. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Once we are saved, why didn't he just call us on home to heaven? Once we got born again, why didn't he just bring us up? right? This world's on our home. We're just passing through. Why did he leave us here in this pilgrimage in this world to suffer, to endure all this? Why didn't he just call us on home? The Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Church, the reason he left us here after we got saved to finish our race is because there's work to do. There's a job that needs accomplished. We are bought with a price. We're not our own now. We belong to Jesus. We are a new creature. And Jesus has work for us to do. And this work has been ongoing since right before his ascension into heaven. And that work is, put simply, to know him more and help more to know him. To know him more and help more to know him. Now, you're not supposed to keep this gospel, the thing that changed your life, the gospel truth, Jesus' message, you're not supposed to keep this to yourself, okay? What Jesus can do for others is not supposed to be the best-kept secret. It's supposed to be the good news proclaimed and given to anyone and everyone who will listen. We're talking about the gospel of Christ should not be hid, right? Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. I want people to see it. I want people to know it. I want people for themselves to get saved and know Jesus as their Savior. Did you know that God desires everyone to be saved? And do you know that's why he put these plans in place so that others could be saved and his gospel continuously spread? 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now you might wonder, all right, pastor, you've made your point. You've preached about getting the gospel locally. You've preached about wanting our money for missions. You've done that and you've done that. Is it really worth it? Is one soul worth it? Pastor, we went on outreach and all we had was one person get saved on Saturday or that missionary that we paid for to go. So far, he's only seen one convert get saved. Pastor, is it really worth it? Does it really matter? Man, I'm glad you asked. Let's go to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. This will be probably the last text I have you turn to. Luke chapter 15. I like to word it this way. According to Scripture, to me, it seems there's a party in heaven 
when one person gets saved. Now, let's read it, and you can come to the conclusion yourself. Luke 15, verse 3. Luke 15, beginning in verse 3. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Let's continue, verse 8. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Those are the words of Christ. That comes from someone who might know what he's talking about. And according to this, if we had 99 people in our church service who were saved, who knew how to act, who were doing their best, praise God, that is wonderful. But the scripture tells us that if one person gets saved, there's more celebration in that than a church service of 99 people who just had a pleasant time at the service. I praise God for 99 people who are saved, who know the Lord, who gather together. That's wonderful. But when one person gets saved... I happen to think there's a party. There's joy. There's happiness. There's rejoicing. There's celebration. There's joy in the presence of the angels when one person gets saved. It's pretty incredible to think that there's something you and I can do here on this earth that affects the attitude, the spirit in heaven there, if you will. There's joy based on what was done here because we're fulfilling the great commission it's a big deal to the host of heaven it's a big deal to our heavenly father and it's a very big deal to the savior jesus christ who was killed bled out on a cross for our sins not just us but the whole world church this is a big deal it's a big deal absolutely one soul is worth it and if you struggle with that and say eh, i don't know what if the one soul was you? What if there's a church like ours sitting around saying, ah, is it really worth it to give to missions? And you're the one soul that's over there in a village in the mountains of the Himalayas that people haven't even discovered yet, waiting to hear about Christ. And because there were churches like this across the nation who said, yes, we will support this man, his family. We're going to give faithfully so we can adopt him and send him and get him going, telling people about Christ. And so months later, they're able to go and they come into contact with this one individual who was lost in darkness. And all of a sudden, the light of Christ was given to them and they trusted Jesus as Savior. They bought into it and they got saved. And now forever, the eternity is secured in heaven. Don't you think it's a difference to them? It would be a difference to you. Put yourself in that situation. Put yourself there. Is one soul really worth it? What if you were the one soul? Then yes, it means everything. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Second Corinthians 9, verse 6 through 8. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Church, what I'm saying is this. Any financial gift that you give towards souls in this world is absolutely blessed and in no way a waste. And if we were to be real... I think every single one of us has something we can give. We have something we can give. And to you, that's not going to alter your world a whole lot. Let's be real. 
It's, it's just not going to change your world a whole lot. You may have to make some minor sacrifices as we talked about. Pizza night, oh no. Is it really worth it? Everybody can give something. Including myself, by the way. I'm not exempt. I plan to give. We can all give something. And it's not going to change your world. But your financial gift to support missionaries, it could change someone else's world. It could change their eternity. I don't, I'm not your priest. Don't come to me and say, how much should I give? That's between you and the Lord. I'm just telling you, it's common sense. We can all give something. And the cause is very worth it. God will bless you. God sees what you give. And as I mentioned, your financial giving toward missions could change someone's eternity. So I'm going to close with this. How committed are you to this commission? And if you're not going to go, that's fine because God calls certain people to go. But will you give so that others can go? Will you give so that others can hear? Father, would you please help us be receptive to how you work in our hearts? Lord, I know money is a touchy subject because, truth be told, we're always after money. But, Lord, money is a tool, and this tool can propel your gospel to go to countless places. Lord, this is where my work ends and yours begins. Holy Spirit of God, I'm begging you. Would you speak to our hearts? And, Lord, we have a couple weeks before Mission Sunday, but, Lord, it's never too early to start dealing with us about what we can do in the area of missions. Lord, not just locally. I pray that you'd help us to be a gospel witness to our neighbors, to our friends, to our coworkers, to the people we come in contact with here. But Lord Jesus, would you please deal with our hearts about what we can do in the area of missions financially. Lord, I am of the persuasion that 100% of the people here can do something. Now what that something is, that's up to you. And I ask that you would deal with us, your people, in this area of giving to missions. Would you please help us? Give us wisdom. Give us discernment. Lord, deal with our hearts as you would see fit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able to, would you stand with me with nobody looking around or talking? If the Lord spoke to your heart, would you do business with him? Would you seek his face regarding this matter? This is truly something that every one of us can get involved in, and I think everyone should get involved in. The question, what would the Lord have you to do? Okay. Now that's something I'm dealing with myself. So if you come say, Pastor, what should I give? That's, that's out of my jurisdiction. That's above my pay grade. I, I don't know. I'm working with what myself and Miss Laura should give to missions. But I know it's something. And I believe it's something for all of us. Let me ask this about your local testimony, your local witness. It'd be a shame if more people around the world knew about our church than the people who actually live in Warwick County. I would hope that as we are giving and praying for missionaries, we are also being a missionary ourselves, a lighthouse in this community, saying there's a church that cares, there's a church will preach the gospel, the Bible will be heard, love it or hate it, the Bible will be heard at this church. Do they know that there's at least an option here? Do they know that you care about their souls? Whatever your need, whatever your concern, you do business with the Lord. look up here. I do appreciate you coming. I know I, I hit you right in the wallet, didn't I? I don't often do that, but hey, that's part of it.
money is a tool and it can be used to accomplish some wonderful things. So I hope that was a help and a challenge to you. And I hope you will plan to get the gospel out here locally, doing our part worldwide and here locally. You know, I have a feeling that one of these days, the Bible says life is but a vapor. One of these days I'm going to wake up, I'm going to be an old man. And uh, several of y'all can testify, say it happens. You wake up one day and you're like, whoa, who's that person looking at me in the mirror? One of these days I'm going to wake up and be an old man. And I'm going to wonder if the legacy I left behind, did it do anything for the cause of Christ? Maybe I made some friends. Maybe I did some cool things here and there, and that's fine. But did I leave anything for Jesus' sake? Are there some souls in heaven based on my labor here while I was here with this short time I had? What eternal difference did I make? And I hope it's something, and I hope you'll have something as well. We do have uh, an order of business to take care of. Brother David and Miss Donna Bozard have been with us for some time. Where are you guys at? You waving? So are you chickening out or are you all in? Okay, amen. Well, they've been visiting here. They, uh, they heard us on the radio. And so they uh, had been praying about a church change for a few reasons, and they heard about us on the radio and uh, came and visited, and they've been here ever since, and I kind of like when they're here. And I told them not long ago, I said, well, if you quit coming, I'm going to have to hunt you down because I like y'all being here so much. But enjoyed talking with them uh, in the office this last week, and they would like to unite with us in membership. And I believe in saved, baptized membership. How about you? Amen. Amen. And so they would like to unite with us in membership. So all in favor of the Bozards uniting with our church, say aye. aye. Are there any opposed? I told you they wouldn't be opposed because we have a, a bus barn that we escort them out back. And we deal with people who oppose. But uh, anyway, so how about will you guys head to the, head to the back door and uh, greet people. And guys, as you leave, greet Mr. and Mrs. Bozard. Welcome them to the, uh, to the church family. And uh, she recently on Facebook called her husband an old buzzard. And uh, I said, is that in, you know, I want to know if that was in relation to how you pronounce the name. And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, his nickname is Buzzard. So uh, now I don't recommend you call him that. He might give you the right hand of fellowship in Jesus' name. But uh, it is good to have Mr. and Mrs. Bozard here with us. And praise God for that. We're going to close in prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Brother Tony Borman, would you please finish cleaning your glasses? And then uh, lift up your voice and close us in prayer. And uh, when Brother Broerman is done praying, we are dismissed. Hope to see you tonight. Choir practice at 5, church at 6. We'll see you then. Brother B, go ahead.